Snub, you should now do the producer's cut of Halloween 6. Well... Okay... First, let's give a little backstory on Halloween 666 Part 6, the origin of the curse of Michael Myers. For fuck's sake, could anyone settle on a subtitle or a fucking number? Original Halloween 6 screenwriter Daniel Ferens completed several drafts of the script, all while the rights to the series were going through different legal battles, resulting in a six-year gap between films before the rights were ultimately bought by Dimension Films. The widespread acclaim of the Halloween 666 script is what caused Donald Pleasance to sign back on, deeming the script the best since the original, and executives at Dimension even claimed the script was so scary they had trouble sleeping that night. Which of course meant that it had to be rewritten. As I mentioned in the theatrical cut episode, the original cut of the film tested negatively with 14-year-olds, so huge portions of the film were reshot, re-edited, with whole subplots taken out, and characters' screen time diminished, which surely resulted in a better product. I was 14 when the movie came out, and I can vouch for the fact that everyone thought it was bullshit. Especially me, because I was in my 10th viewing of Vasodinos. Although, the producer's cut is longer than the theatrical cut, so that's an immediate point against the producer's cut. Also, since this is a producer's cut review, I can include all of the cameos that I was forced to cut out of the theatrical cut. Snub! Snub! Have you seen my beloved Steffi? Bat Hero! The opening of the producer's cut settles on the title H Sideways Witch Hat Halloween 6. I think we all remember the editing from last time. Is this version also gonna feel like someone spilled coffee on the editing machine? What do you know? This one feels like an actual movie. Although they took the Steven out of Paul Steven Rudd, and in this version, I think he may be playing that Pope character. Also, this one has Bogart in it, making it feel classier. But there is something different about the scene where Jamie Lloyd gives birth. <laughs> That is a little more like it. Hey, here's Mr. Hand here. I'm not sure if that change was for the better. Not to mention we get our first slasher character crossover as Creighton Duke shows up to take the baby from Jamie. The man in black doesn't say anything here because we can't give away that obvious twist yet. In the theatrical cut, it was Tommy Doyle providing the narration, but in this one... When Michael Myers was six years old, he stabbed his sister to death. It's Loomis, as it should have been. We can instantly identify him as a character. When it was Rudd doing the voiceover, Paul Rudd hadn't been introduced into the movie yet. This one also provides a flashback showing the ending of Part 5 and that Jamie had been kidnapped after Part 5's events, leading to this labor scene six years later. Jamie, come. Also, she was kidnapped by Darth Vader. Still don't know why the nurse had a change of heart or how she got the baby back. There. It's that way. And again, why is she laughing? Doesn't matter. The nurse is still way dead in this version too. But just the addition of better editing and better music makes this somewhat intense. And the context helps too. Not that any context is gonna save this poor bastard. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. I reviewed this movie like two weeks ago. Hell, the flashback alone sets up why the Strode kid, Danny, is also getting similar orders from the man in black. Though things seem to be a little too easily wrapped up in this version. Stay away, monsters. Stay away, ghouls. Stay away from Danny. You jerks know the rules. Hmm. Well, I'm 
unsatisfied. Four stars! Huh, that's why the A looked weird in the credits. It was designed by a ten-year-old. But rest assured, Tommy is still a creeper this time around, and he's still that weirdo on every radio station. Does this wacko caller have a name? My name's Tommy. I was only eight years old when I saw him, but I was one of the lucky ones. I survived. Playing Ant-Man as Hannibal Lecter was an interesting choice. Not sure if it was a good one, but it was an interesting one. As for Loomis, much of his screen time in the theatrical was cut because the movie's director, Joe Chappelle, found Donald Pleasance to be boring. And if you can't trust the director of Phantoms and the Skulls 2 to make wise decisions when making a horror film, who can you trust? I had a joke in the theatrical cut episode that Loomis's scars have magically disappeared, but in this version... You look good, Sam. I feel great. I, I had uh, surgery, plastic surgery, uh, skin grafts. Perhaps you shouldn't cut out scenes if the result is a plot hole. I shouldn't have to tell you this. In the producer's cut, we even find out why Loomis happened to be listening to the radio program. But I'm not sure why it's still playing in the bus station slash haunted house. Dr. Wynn comes by to announce his retirement to Loomis. I can't remember, is he the bad guy or not? Jamie still calls the radio station and not the police, but we at least get to see Loomis preparing for fucking battle. I think Michael may be one of the ghosts from It Follows. You gotta keep moving or else he will eventually catch up with you, even if he has to walk to your destination. or run you off the road with a van, who keeps giving him a license? This leads to our first ever pumpkin massacre in a Halloween film. All those pies and coffees wasted. Michael still stabs her in this version, only unlike the ridiculously over-the-top death scene from the theatrical cut, she survives. And you know who else is still in the movie? Now you stinking kids got about three seconds to get the hell off my property. One, two... Biff Tannen! Given that this version consistently uses dates on the screen, the sudden appearance of the place and date doesn't bother me this time around. And more Loomis monologues make it even better. Michael is alive. I, I can feel his evil heart beating. I can see him just as I did all those years ago behind these very same walls. Joe Chappelle is a fucking idiot. Wait, I think I know what one of the differences might be. Yes, that Barry Sims. Beth and I are down on this gig. Danny, look, you just bring the posse tonight and we'll hook you up. Peace. In this version, they all die from diabetes. The Strode family all live in the Myers house. It's important to point out that John and Deborah Strode here are named after the original series masterminds John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. Yeah, just keep slipping to the cash. You know, while you're at it, I got a great idea. Here, here, why don't you give her all of our goddamn money? Uh, and I hope the similarities end with the names. John Strode still berates his daughter for having a bastard child, only here it's the combination of witnessing the abuse, hearing the voices, and seeing Michael Myers that causes Danny to pull a knife on his grandfather. But I think we all know the most important change. What the hell happened this time? <gasps> What's gotten into you? The cheap-ass jump scare isn't there. That alone makes this the far superior version. There's more scenes with Danny, but also more scenes with John as well. I don't care what she's done. She's your daughter. She's not my daughter anymore. Making us yearn for his death scene even more. Even Tommy Doyle is more effective because he feels much more like a supporting character instead of a forced lead. It feels much more like an ensemble film with multiple investigations and multiple character developments. Plus, since a bulk of Tommy's stuff wasn't reshot, his character's pretty consistent throughout it instead of turning into a comedian in the last act. Not to mention... 
Jesus. This version also comes with a free bus stop baby. Loomis and Wynn check out the crime scene, complete with the mark of the Thorn Cult, and more Loomis being awesome. And the last thing I need now is you going around spouting off ghost stories. I suppose it was a ghost that did all this. I, it was a ghost talking on the radio last night, and that's a ghost being carried out here right now. And just cut that scene out and add more plot holes. That's what the 14-year-olds want. I see Daniel Harris is sending them her alternate Satan Claus drawings from the last Boy Scout. They really should have brought her back. Even a smaller scene like this has an eerier feeling as Kara Strode constantly feels like she's being watched. Suspense in a Halloween film. Best cut that out, too. Here, they even explain why Loomis is in the hospital when Tommy sees him. It's because Jamie Lloyd is still alive. In the theatrical cut, it looked like he was loitering around the hospital for no reason. Still not sure why Tommy leaves once security shows up, since technically he didn't do anything wrong. All he did was ask for help. Tommy names the baby Steven, since Michael naming him Sassafras was kind of stupid. Okay, Steven. Like that name? Yeah, I think it suits you. You would think that, but if you love it so much, why did you get rid of it in this version? Loomis tells Mrs. Strode more backstory, though I don't know why a relative of Laurie Strode living in the Myers house needs to be told about Michael Myers. But even this scene is better edited this time around. A man came by the house, a psychiatrist by the name of Loomis, and he told me about the terrible things that happened here in our house. Look at how much creepier that shot is without the dun 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 on the soundtrack. Okay, uh, moving on. And whenever I notice that my ex is missing, I always walk a little slower too. And fuck the phone, get the hell out of there! Crap, I already used a Kim Darby True Grit reference in the theatrical cut. I don't know what to say here. Oh, someone has diarrhea after trying Hardy's bacon three-way sandwich. Yikes, in this version it looks like Michael butchered a truck. I don't know why. I wonder if the original tagline was the night he came home and changed the locks. At least this feels like it was made by someone who has seen Halloween. This shows that Joe Chappelle can do well with mood and atmosphere, only he and the studio need to get rid of their self-sabotage fetish. With Tommy waiting in the Strode house, here is the joke that I used last time. Do you know whose room this used to be? Um, the Phantom of the Opera's room? But here is how the scene is edited in the producer's cut. You're in danger. Come with me. Little things. It's the little things that prevent snobbery from happening. Over at Tommy's place, we still get the hilarious Tommy-centric 1978 headlines. Though one of them should have read, local teen Ben Tramer killed in possibly unrelated accident. Jamie may be in the movie more, but at least she gets to lay around most of the time. Mm -hmm. 
And here's where it gets weird. And I mean the good kind of weird. This is how you experiment with editing and a sense of dread in a Halloween film. Not like this. Uh, crap, spilled coffee on the editing software again. Jamie is even given a better conclusion. The work is done now, Jamie. No, oh, that makes too much sense. Have Michael gratuitously push her on farm machinery. Now that the scenes are in their original order, we actually get to see Dr. Loomis mourn the death of Jamie, which is nice. And here's Michael's connection to the Thorn Cult, in case you missed it last time. According to Celtic legend, one child from each tribe was chosen to be inflicted with the curse of Thorn. The sacrifice of one family meant sparing the lives of an entire tribe. So, why are you so concerned about us if Michael's only out to kill his family? In his mind, anyone living in his house is his family. So, in other words, Michael is an asshole. But not as weird as Tommy, who is smelling Kara's hair while telling this story. If Michael succeeds at killing the last of his family, then his curse ends and it'll be passed on to another child. If they had Jamie kidnapped for six years, they probably could have just killed her, but whatever. They got a killer to stop. Kara, whatever you do. Um, don't fall asleep? Don't go back to your house. Oh, right. Sorry. Getting my killers mixed up. Tommy's, uh, house mother does her speech on Halloween again, and while it seems perfectly fine on this end of town, it's thunderstorming like a ghost story over at Tommy's place. I'm sure it's not much better next door. Deborah, I'm home! Thanks for the dinner. Oh yeah, we get to see this guy get killed again. This should be a treat. I remember that being better in the theatrical cut. Okay, so there's one thing the theatrical cut does better, and that's John Strode's death scene. Meanwhile, DJ Brian Adams holds the debate about whether Halloween should be allowed in Haddonfield, and considering that they're at a Halloween party, I think that's a pretty moot point. But these are people who are shocked when the shock DJ they invited turns out to be a sleazy shock DJ, and pretty much gets killed in the same fashion. And then his show was replaced by the David Lee Roth show. Serves him right for accidentally getting in the wrong van, fucking idiot. Was Myers counting on him making that mistake? Speaking of idiots. Beth, um, what you said before about Michael Myers living in our house, is that really true? How is it that the only people who don't know about the Myers house are the family associated with Michael's sister and who tried selling the Myers house? For Christ's sake, from 1978 to 1995, kids still decorate the house in Myers gear. Maybe they were right to cancel Halloween. All it did was cause kids to dance and sing under bleeding trees the dead bodies fall out of. I still wish this version would explain how Michael secretly got that body up there, and why Loomis just happens to show up. But whatever. Boobs. <laughs> I thought the people having sex survived in the theatrical cut. <laughs> Just kidding. They got butchered as hell. Though, look at the editing in the theatrical. <laughs> yeah, it's edited like a film student making their first music video. This version, however... Carol, what the hell is going on? Look out, there's someone in the room. He's right behind you. <gasps> It's edited like a horror film. When Kara goes to look for the now missing Danny, it shows how using the quieter score can elevate the menace. And 
thankfully, she's not making the usual Strode mistake of dropping the weapon any time they think he's dead. But the baby being stolen proves that someone on the inside knows their whereabouts. Who knew? Nobody knew except me and... Danny, come to me. I knew it. It was the fucking candle. Now to really find out the identity of the man in black. When? Hang on, I thought it was going to turn out to be Pamela Voorhees. It, oh, uh, my brain is mushing all of these movies together. And stop staring at me! Like before, Mrs. Blankenship is involved with the Thorn Cult. Not sure why she wouldn't just kill Tommy in his sleep, but after Kara knocks herself out trying to escape, the movie gets very, very different from last time we saw it, with some stuff that is still there. I feel like I've been drugged. We have been drugged. Why are they doing this? Why didn't they just kill us? Yeah, there's still not a good explanation for that. They track them down at Smith's Grove with even more additions. I think Michael is under the influence of an evil rune. Thorn. I saw the symbol. How do you expect 14-year-olds to know what runes are? Best cut that out. Wynn wants Loomis to join them and even take over for Wynn, who is meant to protect and watch over Michael. Meanwhile, Tommy just hangs out. I added that. Kinda wish it was actually there. Michael's sacrifices are intended to restore balance to famine, plagues, and Tyler Perry movies. Though they really shouldn't have rested all this on Michael, since he's pretty much consistently failed at killing Strodes or Myers, with the exception of his sister, but that was in the early 60s. Here, though, we see Tommy save Kara from the Temple of Doom by leading them on a riveting minecar chase. Oh, and what was hinted at in the theatrical version is all but admitted here. You know whose baby it is, don't you? Michael! The baby is yours, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it, Michael? Ew, bad uncle! Bad touch! When the original climax was reshot, none of the reshoots contained Donald Pleasance, who had died right after initial production. So here we see a lot more Loomis as they escape, as opposed to him being knocked out and, oh, hello again. Here Michael is held off with the power of the runes. So you can shoot Michael, you can stab him, and you can blow him up. That won't do shit though. What you need is runes. Runes are his Achilles heel. Sorry I'm late, Michael. I had to change out of my cult gear and put on my man in black clothes. Even Wynn is given a proper resolution, as it wasn't until I was editing the theatrical cut episode that I even noticed he was in the operating room massacre. So Loomis says goodbye to them like in the theatrical, only instead of getting this ending... <laughs> you know, when the movie just abruptly died. Wynn passes on his duty to Loomis, who is now the de facto Thorn leader, and Myers, now dressed in the man in black clothes, escapes into the night, leading to a sequel which never happened in favor of the H2O reboot. There is still much to criticize about this film, other than it being a slasher film, but unlike the theatrical version, this one has a beginning, it has a middle, it has an end, it has character development, plot consistency, it's got editing, mood, atmosphere, suspense, it has better character arcs, and oh, what's the word, resolutions, eh, but just take all that shit out and vomit it up into theaters. Good job, idiots! Oh, it's nice that both versions are dedicated to Donald Pleasance. They loved him so much, they cut out most of his scenes and called them boring. 
The original screenwriter had plenty of negative things to say about both versions of the film, but even he admits that the producer's cut is a better product, and even completely negative reviews of the producer's cut also admit that this one is at least a movie. Well, that does it for musical Halloween in October. Or, uh, I mean, uh... October Halloween reviews. I best get out of here before Bat Hero. Where the fuck did he go? Hang on, I gotta see about this. Sorry, I originally had an ending where Bat Hero was inflicted with the curse of Steffi Love, forcing him to stare down internet movie reviewers, and the only thing I could defeat him with was precious runes. But the stupid neighborhood kids didn't like that ending very much. Plus, the Bat Hero actor died. Mommy, you 